How many of you have heard of mutation testing? I know you have. Anybody else? All right, a handful of people. So you may find the intro to be a wee bit boring, but then we'll get into a demo of the specific tool. For everyone else, we're going to build up to what mutation testing is and why we want it. But every place I go, I do a commercial to say I wrote a book, because that's really, really, really cool. And for this one, we got all the holidays. In case you want to buy a book for Festivus, you can put it under the Festivus tree. <laughs> All right, so why do we write tests? There are two main reasons. One of them is to catch bugs. We don't want to have defects or bugs in our software. So we write tests to ensure that the code works the way we expect it to. The other one is to make sure it keeps working the way we expect it to. Right? Regression is really important when it comes to testing. You don't want to be sitting around, but it used to work. What happened since then? How do we know if our tests are any good? Right? This is something that management talks about. Well, what's your test coverage? Did you guys write good tests? I think it's pretty apparent from this example that this is not, in fact, good coverage. Right? There's a lot of red. We can see it on the screen. We're barely above 50%. It's a pretty good bet that the coverage for this particular class is lousy, and we shouldn't even be thinking about the quality of our tests. We should be writing more. And this is an important point with mutation testing. If you don't have high coverage on your class, you can't do mutation testing. You'll see why a little later, but the message here is you have to at least think you're writing good tests and high, have high coverage for mutation testing to be of any value for you. So if the coverage is low, you're not in good shape, you need to write more tests. <coughs> but the coverage might be high. In this particular example, it's a nice little toy example that I wrote for this group. It runs a registration system where you register for the meeting, and if the meeting is full, it puts you on a wait list. It's not thread safe so that I could write it faster, and because it's not real. But it was pretty easy to write coverage for 100%. Our developer has high coverage. He's all done. The code is perfect. The tests are perfect. There's nothing more to say, right? Well, not exactly. You try to use this 100% tested piece of software and it doesn't exactly work. In particular, the wait list never gets anybody added to it. Who sees what's wrong with this particular piece of code? No pointer. There is not an old pointer. You can assume that attendees and wait lists have been initialized in the constructor. But that would be a possibility. The, the answer is on the screen. One of these lines of code is wrong. Does anybody see it? That's right, it always returns false. That's not good. We don't need a method that always returns false. In this case, whether you got registered for the meeting or not, you got a nice message that told you, sorry, the meeting is full, you're on the wait list. Clearly not what you had in mind. And this is something that mutation testing can help you uncover. What mutation testing does is it changes the code. It makes very small, isolated changes to the code and sees if your test catches them or not. In this case, it changes from false to true. And if the test doesn't catch it, you've got a problem because your test isn't thorough or good in any fashion. So we've also got mutants. That's a female mutant. Maybe we'll see a male mutant a little later. But the problem with this technique is you could sit around fiddling with your code. You could make changes here. You could change an if statement. You could change true to false. You could comment on a for loop. But that would take forever, because there's hundreds of mutations you could make to your code. You don't have time to sit around and make them all. And more importantly, why on earth would you want to? That sounds really boring, doesn't it? Sit around fiddling with your code to see if the test pass? So mutants are everywhere. These are the male mutants, I promise. We've got the Ninja Turtles. Luckily, there's automation for this. Up until recently, mutation testing wasn't practical because it was too slow. Luckily, CPUs have caught up, and mutation testing now is practical. And even better, there's an Eclipse plugin for it. I know what you're thinking, there's an Eclipse plugin for everything. But there's also an Eclipse plugin for mutation testing. There's a tool called PI Test that does mutation testing. The plugin Eclipse wraps that plugin and allows you to do mutation testing right in Eclipse, just like you're running the unit tests. And before anyone asks, no, PI does not in fact stand for anything. It's like PMD. So it's really easy to run. We're going to look at some screenshots of it running, and then we're going to switch over to Eclipse and see a live demo. To run it, you have to have a passing unit test. If you don't have a passing unit test, you don't get a Eclipse report. You get a failure message. 
And that makes sense. If your unit tests don't pass, you don't know if they're catching anything anyway, what's the difference whether mutation testing works? You're nowhere. But assuming that it does work, you click run as, just like you'd run your unit tests, and instead of choosing unit tests, you choose pit mutation test. A console goes by really fast with lots and lots and lots and lots of information. I included the very beginning and the very end here. But this beginning part goes on for a long time. And what it's doing is it's logging everything it does. It's showing you every mutant it finds, everything it tried, what happened, if there was any information. There's minions! And finally, it tells you that it's done. The reason this console is useful is it takes a lot longer to run a pit test, um, mutation test, than it does to run a regular unit test. You run your unit test, if you don't get results back within half a second or a second, you're thinking something's wrong, which trains us to expect results fast when we run our tests. But when we run the pit mutation test, it's running your unit tests hundreds of times, possibly thousands of times if your code is big and complex. For my toy example, it runs it more than, more than 100 times. So you see that this is running. If the console is still going, you feel better that something's happening behind the scenes. It's kind of like tailing a log file. It makes you feel comfortable about the endeavor, and you know that it's, something is happening, and you're going to get output. It's not, in fact, stuck. Once it finishes, you get a summary report. This gives you a general feel for how good your tests are. Now, you remember our little um, ponytail-haired developer there was very proud of his 100% test coverage. But perhaps he shouldn't be so proud, because Pit Clips found 12 things that it could change about the code, and his test only caught five of them. He was below a 50% rate of catching actual potential issues in the code. Those are not thorough tests at all. When you drill down, you can see more detail about the tests, and it's color-coded, which means if you're red-green colorblind, you are not going to like this report. For everyone else, a bit of a legend here. If the background of a line is green, that means the unit test covered it. If the background of a line of code is red, that means the unit test didn't cover it. If the unit test didn't cover it, you have no hope of mutation testing finding an error because you don't even have code coverage on that line. The ones that have a white background, mean that there is no bytecode on that line. And we can see that's the method signature and the closed squiggly bracket. It doesn't make sense to talk about the code coverage of a closed squiggly bracket. Now we get to the colors of the foreground, which are more interesting. In this case, we have 100% coverage. So everything in the background is, in fact, green and covered. When we get to the foreground, we see line 40. There's a number one there, which means there was one mutant attempted on the line. And the fact that the foreground is dark green means that our test caught that mutant. They captured it, they killed it, it's gone. And killing a mutant means that your test detected there was an error. So if I change that line of code from false to true and a test fails that wasn't formerly failing, that's awesome. That means that test was good and it actually did something. If the foreground color is red, it means that it did not catch the mutant. The mutant escaped, and we should all ride or hide in under the chairs because there's a mutant on the loose. It's probably not a surprise to anybody that return true and return false weren't covered in my code because that's where the defect lived. You also have this mutations view, which is a more detailed view of the state of affairs. It tells you each mutant that it tried and the status of it. On top are the survived mutants. There were seven mutants here that survived. Those are the ones that we have a problem we need to write better tests for. It also tells you what they were. So you can see the type of thing that we tried. It tried changing zeros to ones, trues to false, negating conditionals, returning a bad integer. All of those are things that it didn't find, which means I have horrible test coverage on the logic and on the boundary conditions. It also tells you about the five ones that it killed, which were in that space. So maybe my coverage that was horrible wasn't quite so horrible but it also wasn't good. Now, once you get used to running this tool, you may be worried there aren't enough ones, right? It's like a video game. You kill them all, that you need more so they come at you faster. Luckily, Pit Clips allows you to level up. There's three different levels you can use in your mutation testing. The screenshot I showed was default mutators. I showed them so they wouldn't be overwhelming, and more importantly, so they would all fit on the screen. When I run this for real, I use either the stronger mutators or all mutators because I am good at writing tests, which means the default mutators are less likely to find things, and I would rather have a stricter bar in order to write my tests too. But you can change this as much as you want. 
if you inherit legacy code and you look at it and say, ugh, they didn't write good tests, it's a good time for your workspace to be using the default mutators so you can fix the low hanging fruit. If you're working on something that's security or sensitive or really, really important or involves money, you probably want to be at a higher level of coverage and use all mutators. So when I switched it to all mutators, we jumped from 12 to 32 mutations that survived. That's a lot. It's a big number. And we can see that it tried more interesting things here. It tried getting rid of methods to put things in the map. Well, that's important. I put it in the map because I want the registrants to be able to attend the meeting, not just because I wanted to have a map. So I care greatly whether the test caught that or not. It substituted numbers. It tried removing calls. It tried replacing an equality check with the false and got rid of my equality check altogether. So this is really cool because it's doing test coverage for us. There's going to be a demo shortly, but I have one more slide. Remember that all the tests must pass. If the tests don't pass, no mutation testing. Make your tests pass. It's really important to have passing tests. Watch the console to see if it's still running, especially at the beginning. It really is nerve-wracking to have nothing happen for the longest time, and this could take a minute if you have real code, like an actual minute. Um, it reports on the whole project. You can look at the part of the report for just your class, but it does give you data on the whole project. So if you're working on legacy <laughs> code where the code that you just wrote is really well tested, and the rest of it is horribly tested, make sure that you drill down and don't look at the overall number because the overall number will be scary. And finally, fixing one mutant might take care of more. Mutants tend to congregate. It's almost like you have a bio mutant fighting virus that you kill one and the neighbors are gone. So let's take a look at what this looks like in real life. We're going to use Eclipse here and we're going to start by looking at the class. Is this readable? Mm -hmm. Excellent. It's huge here. So we've got this really simple class. It's about 100 lines. It was written just for this meeting. And as I mentioned earlier, yes, I know it is in the thread safe. We've got a capacity. Um, that's a variable rather than a constant to facilitate unit testing. We've got a map of attendees. So we know who's attending the meeting, their name, and their company, because you've never registered for a meetup without having to say where you're from. And a length hash map so we can maintain an ordered wait list. We don't just want to allow random people to come to the meeting when the wait list frees up. We want it to be first come, first serve. So in the constructor, we initialize all of those things. We took the capacity from the test or the caller, so we have it. Registering for the meeting, we check if there's more room. If there is more room, we allow them in the meeting. Here I fix the meeting bug. And if not, we put them on the wait list. If somebody gets off the wait list, we cancel them, we remove them from the list of the attendees, we check if there's still room for more attendees because maybe someone canceled who wasn't attending in the first place. And there's room on the wait list, we put somebody from the wait list onto the attendee list and we remove them from the wait list. We race conditions abound in this method. Um, we check if they're registered, we check if there's more room, and we check the sizes. So this isn't terribly complex code. It's meant to be simple so that we can remember what it does without a lot of thought and we can focus on the tests. Now if I run my test, and I'm going to run it in regular mode just to make sure that it actually works, and we can see that I have a green bar. My tests do in fact work, which is good because, as we remember, passing tests are a prerequisite for mutation testing. Now I'm going to run the same thing again, but I'm going to run it in mutation testing mode. And if I look at the console, it was faster than me because this code is a toy. If you run it against anything real, it takes far longer. Um, we see our summary, and we can see that I have um, 20 mutants, so I'm not in, I'm sort of in the middle of the strictness of it. And I can drill down and see my one class. Again, if you have more classes, you get to see more stuff. And we can see what it found. So on this line, remember green means the mutants were caught, but it found two things to try. One of them was getting rid of the whole line, and the other was calling the constructor and not assigning it to the variable. At this point, you've exhausted the number of things you can do wrong to an empty hash map. So that's pretty thorough, right? I don't have to do anything, and it's covering it for me. We can also look at some of the lines that are not tested. And those are more interesting because together as a group, we're actually going to try to fix some of these mutants and see that the report changes. So I'd like somebody to pick a line of code that has one or more mutants on it. I don't know how to make this bigger. Line 40? 
Line 40. Excellent. So line 40 has four mutants on it. it they tried removing the conditional, which survived, and three other mutants that are killed. So negating the conditional, good, it was killed. Removing the call to the method in the if statement overall, good, it was killed. And replacing the equality check with a false was killed. So the only one that wasn't killed is the one that was true. Now let's take a look at the test and see what we can do about that. A test I can make bigger. So looking at the logic, I tested a few conditions. I tested if there was one attendee. I tested if there were the maximum amount of attendees. And I checked that there were too many attendees. And also that a cancellation moves up the waitlist. So let's see what we can do about that in order to actually check this method. I see a problem that I didn't check if there was room for more than one attendee. So we're one over capacity, we have a problem. If we're two over capacity, we don't know what happens. So let's try that and see if it makes any difference to us. It should, but I want to show the fact that we can write a test and not have anything happen. So let's see, we need somebody else to attend this meeting. I'm going to pick Victor, because he's in the room. Victor. Make sure to spell the host company's name right. Okay, so I'm gonna run pick clips again, and I expect to see nothing different, because this test is exactly equivalent to the previous test, and lo and behold, nothing changed. So that tells me that my problem isn't a logic path problem. My problem is that I'm doing something wrong. I'm not testing something that's important. And there's clues, because when I look around it, I see that I did not, in fact, test the entire method. So maybe the problem isn't this line of code. Maybe the problem is this whole slew of code nearby that isn't tested. Hmm, that seems interesting. And I see the problem there is that I don't actually assert anything. So I'm registered for this meeting. Great. I've just increased the quality of the test. I've had to assert something. Maurice is also registered for the meeting because he's speakers and speakers should be registered first. Now our capacity for this meeting is tiny because it's a toy. So Barry, who registered third, has a problem and does not get to come to the meeting. Poor Barry. Good thing he signed <laughs> up to do attendance and gets to come anyway. So let's try running this again and seeing if we get different output. We should. We're now at 58% mutation test coverage, and we caught more of the mutants. If we drill down, we should be able to see that we did do, in fact, a better job. Yay, we tested the line of code we were shooting for. In fact, we also got the assert true and the assert false in there. That's great. However, we still have two more mutant, potential mutants. And we can see that both mutants on here survived, if it replaced the call with a put to pass something different instead of name and company, it failed. And if it got rid of the put overall, that failed. So that tells us that we're still missing an assert in here. Can anybody think of what we might like to assert? An integer string. An integer string on what? OK, so we could assert something about waitlist. <coughs> Let's see what's available to us about waitlist. We've got the number of people on the waitlist. That's something that we could assert. So assert equals, we're expecting one person to be on the waitlist, and that's Barry. So let's see if that makes any difference. Our before number was 58%, and we're going to see if we did better now. 63%, we did better. So that should get our method that we're trying to test here fully covered. And it did. We got a green method. Woohoo! And that wasn't really hard, right? It let us look at the code, it let us look at the test, but it let us look at it more focused. It's really easy to say I have 100% test coverage or even I have 100% branch coverage and think you have everything tested that needs to be tested. And as we know, when we're working with finance or security, which a good number of us in the room are, the bar is higher. It needs to be right. It doesn't just need to be covered. And mutation testing helped with that. You can see this was pretty fast. Now, I know what you're thinking. Your class is not a nice, tiny, um, how long was this? 84 line program. And that's true, of course it's not. But, but it's linear. 
If your program is bigger, it's scaling with the complexity of each method, not the complexity of the program as a whole. So you don't have to worry about exponential time. This is so much faster than all of its successors that it's really awesome to use. So in the remaining three minutes, I'm curious to see if anyone has any questions on mutation testing or PI tests. How old is, how old is this play with JMark here? It, JMock is fine. I haven't used it with Makito, but I can't imagine it's a problem because it's just running your unit tests. It's mutating the bytecode and running your existing tests against it, so it shouldn't care. Other questions? Was this inspired by genetic programming anyway? Yeah, the research was. There's been research papers in the space of bio and in the space of computer science for this for a really long time, and they related very nicely. It just wasn't feasible to do until fairly recently. So do the mutations happen in program text or in bytecode? They're happening in bytecode. Right. Any others? Uh, have you had any success integrating this into like continuous integration environments? We're not yet running it in a continuous integration environment. It's pretty new to us, so we're using it with the developers to train them to write better tests. Um, I would love to get to the point where we're able to have high enough coverage that it makes sense to automate this. Any others? Probably. Yes. Someone says yes. I'm the clips user, sorry. I know I'm the minority here. Any others? All right, and with that, we'll turn it back to right. Frank. Thank you.